Hello, and welcome to the BYU Library Family History webinar. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on January 12th with James Tanner. He will be giving a presentation entitled, How to Research Your Genealogy in Archives and Libraries. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Michael Strauss, who will be giving a presentation on influenza, the 20th century's deadliest pandemic. Before we begin, here is a little bit about Michael. Michael L. Strauss is a professional accredited genealogist and is employed as a research manager at Ancestry Pro Genealogists in Lehigh, Utah. A native of Pennsylvania, he has a BA in history and a United States and is a United States Coast Guard veteran. He is a qualified expert witness in the courts of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, and a faculty member of SI, SLIG, GRIP, and IGHR, where he is a military course coordinator. And if Michael is ready, we'll turn the time over to him. Thank you very much, Olivia. Let me uh, share my screen. I'll get started. Well, good uh, good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you are uh, in in this uh, this fine day. So I want to thank uh, BYU for the uh, kind invitation to come and present uh, a, a topic which I which I do love to talk about. Uh, a lot of history behind that, uh, where our families had many families had to um, deal with the problems that this uh, pandemic caused, and I think it's. It's an appropriate topic that we talk about it today as we are still trying to understand all of the effects of the current pandemic of COVID-19 that we're still experiencing, uh, even now, as, as many families still struggle. The, um, the pandemic itself uh, in 1918 from 100 years ago has a long history, of course. And um, what I hope to do is I hope to talk about some of the historical attributes of that pandemic, uh, and then talk about some of the places where you can find records of your family that were involved in the pandemic, both those that were civilians and those that had served in the military. Now, uh, I always start my lectures out with something visual. I think that's important. And this is a beautiful image from the Library of Congress. It's from their collection. It's a group of uh, female Red Cross ambulance attendants and it was taken in st louis missouri and you can see them holding stretchers and wearing masks and they are awaiting uh so, a delivery of some influenza patients and again the library of congress has this original image as does many other images of the period in addition to the national archives and i think it makes a nice start to our topic as we think intently about uh, about what I'm going to share. Now, when the pandemic came about in 1918, we were going through a period of history during World War I. The war had begun in August of 1914 and was still going on at the time that the pandemic began and would not end until November 11th of 1918. And it was during this same period of time that we were fighting our very first modern war. There were countries had come up with new ways to kill each other, and they had done it so that it was very effective. For the first time, we see tank warfare. We see the use of flamethrowers. We see airplanes used in combat for the first time. Chemical warfare is first used against troops on the other side. All of this occurs during the period of World War I, that first modern war that began in August of 1914. And if that wasn't bad enough, you had submarine warfare for the first time. Soldiers experienced mortar fire, machine gun fire. All of this was relatively brand new to the military armies of the world. And if that in itself was not enough to, to uh, kill a soldier, soldiers in the trenches had to deal with had to deal with trench foot 
or trench fever, something that would also uh, was a deadly killer. But at the end of the day, when the numbers were added up, as far as those who died in combat, as a result of all these different new methods of killing, those numbers were small and were dwarfed by those numbers that killed from the pandemic. A lot of people around the world came to call this illness the Spanish flu. That was the name that was attributed to it. And this was because Spain was one of the very first countries to report deaths from the pandemic in their local newspapers. And you have to understand why this came to be called the Spanish flu. It was because Spain, during World War I, had remained neutral. So during the entire First World War, Spain was neutral. They did not impose any sort of wartime censorship, unlike the United States, England, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, all the other warring countries who were in this war all had censored their news. Spain did not. So when the king of Spain, pictured here, King Alfonso VIII of Spain, became ill with the influenza, most people believed worldwide this was where the flu had originated. On an interesting note, the king did survive and lived to 1941. I don't know if that name does sound familiar to you for the king's uh, King Alfonso, but he was the same king who was a young 13-year-old boy who at the time of 1898 was the king of Spain who we fought against during the Spanish-American War. His father had just passed, and his mother, uh, Maria Cristina of Austria, was uh, the regent. Uh, in charge of the country at that time. So Alphonse was well known uh, globally around the world. But if the flu didn't start in Spain, where did it start? There is some mystery that surrounds the origins of the flu. There are two theories that have emerged, by at least initial theories that have emerged. One of those theories was that some researchers and scientists and historians have suggested that the flu began at a British army base located at Etop, France. Now, what is known at that location in France is there were a series of mutinies that occurred there in 1917 when the British army uh, took that place during World War I. That is known history. The other which was more recent, was a hypothesis that suggested that the flu started somewhere in China. There was no one that could offer an explanation as to where in China, just China as a country. And they couldn't even offer a date or even a range of time during the calendar year of 1917 before the flu allegedly moved into Europe. Again, these were the first two theories that emerged. But in both cases, the evidence doesn't support those claims. So that leads us to other theories, other possibilities of where this flu could have originated from. A lot of scientists, historians, and researchers have gotten on board with the idea that the flu actually began here in the United States. It began in a rural Kansas County, Haskell County, Kansas. You can see on the map here, the uh, state capital of Topeka in the eastern part of the state, just to the south there, you see the city of Wichita. And just to the west of Topeka is Camp Funston, near present-day Fort Riley. Due west and uh, south is a rural county called Haskell County. You can see it there highlighted in red. In late 1918, in February, in this small rural county, a mysterious illness began to run unchecked within the population. In just a matter of a couple of weeks, ordinary, healthy, young citizens had become violently ill, and there was no offer of an explanation. 
Now, some believe that the flu was caused by the H1N1 virus, and this gene uh, has an avian origin. And there's others that speculate it came from swine. The vote is still out on all the exacts, but it is generally believed that this was where the flu had originated. As quickly as this unknown disease appeared in that February period of 1918, it vanishes. And it's around this same time that young men of military age, 18 to 25 is your age range, they start to be inducted into the military service and are to report to duty at Camp Funston between the time of February 28th and March 2nd. This is from all over the state, soldiers from all over the state and the surrounding states. One of the physicians who was a Haskell County health officer by the name of Loring Minor, he had no idea what was causing this sickness of the area residents. Public officials reported the fact that there was a flu, but knew nothing more than that. By then, unfortunately, it was just too late. The illness had spread along with those soldiers of military age who were now moving into the military camps. And the, the why was because we had just passed the Selective Service Act of 1917, otherwise known as the World War I draft. Because we were drafting men, we had to have a way and a means to train them properly in the event that the United States would go to war. Well, as it turned out, the U.S., of course, went to war April 6th, 1917. And these men were all being drafted to go into the Army to be trained at Camp Funston, and then on to Europe to the war zone. So these recruits for this, for uh, these areas of the of the country, that region at least, to start, came to Camp Funston, where the men would be in close contact with one another. Shortly after, thousands of these men started to arrive. In a period of about a week. March 11th through March 18th, and this is documented, records do show that process, more than 500 of those soldiers became ill, again, with no known cause. And these are healthy types. Within three weeks after that, the number had more than doubled. There were now more than 1,000 men that were sick. By the end of spring, of those 1,000-plus men, 48 of them are now dead. Their causes of death are listed on death certificates as spinal meningitis, pneumonia. Again, these men are young, they're healthy. The army decides the only thing that they can do is quarantine and isolate the men. But just like it had occurred in Haskell County, the disease comes and it soon disappears. So it's only there for a short period. And one of the reasons that it is attributed to that is that in the next couple of months, these men start to be transferred. They start to be transferred to other camps and bases. And eventually, as part of the American Expeditionary Force, they are sent to Europe to fight. Little do they know, they are traveling with a silent, deadly killer. Just to give you an idea visually of just how bad this phase of the illness was at Camp Funston, you can see a converted large military building just for the housing of patients at the base hospital because the base hospital was overwhelmed with the numbers. And in turn, they had to turn to other areas of the same camp in order to uh, accommodate those who had become ill. This is a very sobering image, I think. Once the virus reaches Europe, it unfortunately spreads very quickly, starts to visit the armies fighting in World War I. And in a very short time, within months after the United States arrives, because there's no documented evidence that the illness 
is there before the United States arrives with soldiers, the armies of France, Germany, Russia, Italy, England, the United States are all affected in a very short time. The flu runs unchecked through the army. And it's hard to really wrap your mind around this, the, these numbers, but in a very short time, one third of the combined military forces of both sides, allied and central powers, are affected by the, their inability to fight during this war. But the flu comes back to the United States. And one of the first documented instances of that happening occurs on a luxury liner that arrives in New York Harbor in August of 1918. The ship's captain records that there are 21 cases of the flu. Five of those passengers die. This is one of the very earliest cases reported of the flu coming back to the United States. All the while, while the fighting is going on in Europe and men are getting sick and dying, it's relatively quiet here. That all changes in the summer of 1918. That strain that first appeared in Kansas in Haskell County in February and March is mild. That's the first strain. This is the second strain, the one that comes back from Europe. This one's much more stronger. It's deadlier. The disease, once it comes back to the United States, spreads very quickly. One of the very first places that gets overrun with cases of the influenza is located just outside of Boston. It's at Camp Devons, uh, just outside of the city of Boston. Uh, well, today as well, of course, uh, the area that's Camp Devons. Camp Devons is the first army camp to report a large number of their men sick from this unknown disease, the unknown cause of the disease. The mortality rate jumps 2.5% for the month. Now, 2.5% may not seem like a large number to you, but when you really sit down and think about that, that number reflects 25 times the normal death mortality rate. So wrap your mind around that number instead. Dr. Victor Vaughn, who is the uh, head of the Army Surgeon General's office, he is summoned in Washington and he is asked to find a solution. Because of his position as the Surgeon General, this has now become his responsibility. So, of course, he immediately heads to Camp Devon. On the day he arrives in the camp, 63 soldiers die from influenza. On the day he arrives. We are very fortunate to have Vaughn's own words describing what he witnessed. Vaughn is very quick to realize that this flu is unlike anything else anyone has ever seen. We've had outbreaks of influenza before, going into the 1890s, even a little earlier, but nothing of this caliber. This flu targets the young and the old. Normally, you would think a flu would, but this one is also striking down the healthy. So all, all groups of people are targeted with this flu as opposed to what has happened in the past. So in his journal, Vaughn writes, and I want to share his words exactly. I think that's it's important. The saddest part of my life was when I witnessed the hundreds of deaths of soldiers in the army camps, and I didn't know what to do. And to humbly admit our dense ignorance in this case, I saw hundreds of stalwart men in uniform coming into the wards of the hospital. Every bed was full, yet others crowded in. Their faces wore a bluish cast, and cough 
brought up bloodstained putum. So you can hear in his own words, he does not know what to do. But Vaughn isn't someone who will give up. He may not understand the flu. He may not know how to combat it quite yet. But he takes himself and his team of doctors and he decides to combat this disease with everything that he has at his fingertips. He brings in the very best and brightest to look into this problem and find a solution, if one exists. I want to share the words of someone who was over in France as well, who experienced word from home of someone who had become sick and could do nothing and could not leave France to come and be with that person and how hard that was emotionally. This is a name you'll no doubt know. I don't know if the image alone does it, but this is a very young Captain Harry S. Truman, who served in the 129th Field Artillery in the United States Army during World War I with the American Expeditionary Forces. He wrote a letter from Camp La Boelle near the battle site of Verdun in January of 1919. Let me uh, share some of his words. Last evening was a glorious one, even if it was raining. I'm so glad that you're out of danger from that awful flu. He's writing to Bess Wallace. That's the recipient of his letter. Bess Wallace uh, was to be his future bride. He had not married her yet. You have no idea how uneasy I've been since hearing you had it. We over here can realize somewhat how you must have felt when we are under fire a little. He has equated this flu to being in combat. It is just as bad. Every day, nearly someone in my outfit will hear that his mother, his sister, his sweetheart is dead. It's heartbreaking almost to think. I'm hoping the worst is past and that from now on, we'll never hear of it again. I think the last sentence really is telling. It seems that war and pestilence go hand in hand. Truman could not have been more right. So Vaughn would see letters like this from soldiers in France. What are you going to do to help our loved ones here back at home where we have no control? We can't leave our posts to come back. What can you do? Well, one of the first things that Vaughn did, which was a great idea, was to institute a national, uh, a, a national push to have the Red Cross be brought in to bear on this problem. Now, the Red Cross was not new. It was founded in 1881. It was almost 40 years old. But the Red Cross was brought in specifically, and numbers were increased to help with this pandemic. Over the course of the war, unfortunately, because these, these first-line responders, if you will, were right up there in the, in the trenches uh, with the soldiers in Europe or here at home, in, in close proximity with those that were sick, almost four, well, 400 men and women who worked for the Red Cross died as a result of the influenza. On Ancestry, they have these Red Cross nursing files, which would give you an idea of those that served with the Red Cross during this period. You see the files date from 1916 to 1959. Here's just one example. This is the example of Mrs. John Franklin Allen in 1917. It provides her badge number and details about her nursing service and the fact that she had served during the period of the height of the pandemic. At the height of this epidemic, 
theaters, churches, public gathering places were all shutting down. The fear of the spread of this disease was real. People were frightened. They did not know what to do. They were looking to their leaders and their members of Congress and those in charge for answers. It was not uncommon to see pictures like the one on the left. All theaters closed until further notice uh, it, at the request of the mayor. Or on the right, you see a, a newspaper notice from the Chicago Tribune. Many cities in the United States, especially the larger metropolitan cities, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Boston, all suffered high mortality rates. But it was 1918, the month of October, that was the worst hit of all. That was the third and final string that had occurred. Many cities started to report the greatest number of deaths than they had had in the past. Within weeks, these same cities started to report peaks in their death tolls. So the toll of death rose, 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 and then finally reached a pivot point, just like we experienced with COVID-19. And afterwards, the numbers started to decline gradually and started to lessen. Of those cities I mentioned, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, and the others, Philadelphia was the hardest hit of all of them. And there was a reason. This occurred around the time that the war ended. World War I ends November 11th, 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. There were many that wanted to celebrate. City officials in Philadelphia warned and said, please do not have a victory parade. Fell in deaf ears. The city had a parade. And within days, hundreds of people got sick and many more would die. Another city that was definitely hard hit was that of Chicago. Their health commissioner, this man, John Dill Robertson, because of the sudden upsurge in cases, he ordered all public areas closed until the flu could be brought under control. But as I said, we started to see the gradual decline after that third peak, third strain reached its peak. By January of 1919, the illness had mostly run its course. Those persons who didn't succumb from the virus or had died from complications that might have been caused by bacteria uh, who, or who had died from pneumonia, doctors believed that those persons had somehow possibly had become immune now think about this in larger numbers. World War I claimed 16 million lives due to combat and civilians lost as a result of the war. This had nothing to do with the pandemic. These were just lives lost due to the war. The influenza epidemic that swept the same world at the same time estimated a toll of 50 million people as opposed to 16 million caused by all of World War I. To put that in better perspective for you, 50 million people represented roughly one-fifth of the population of the world. This pandemic killed more people in 10 months than, in, than any other illness in recorded history, including the plague of the 14th century. Let's look at it from a different angle, from a different lens. More than 4.7 million United States soldiers served under arms. Those men that were drafted, called up from the National Guard, or those men that were in the regular army. More than 116,000 deaths 
were recorded within the military. But breaking that down to two types of deaths, those from any form of combat, whether they were prisoner and had died, whether they, uh, any other form of death from combat uh, that were killed in action or died as a result of wounds afterwards, 63,000 of those 116,000 died as a result of combat-related experiences. 53,000 died due to the pandemic. Those numbers are pretty close. Half the army was struck down as far as the numbers were concerned. So as genealogists, we naturally will gravitate towards those records that will tell us information about family members of ours who survived the pandemic, or if they didn't survive, they will also tell us those that died as a result of the pandemic. For your consideration, I have some examples here. Death records, coroner records, city directories, newspaper records, court records, all have the potential to tell you so much about this time period and the effects on human society, socially, what was going on during the peak times of the pandemic. Of course, we know that death certificates contain a lot of useful genealogical and historical information on our family members. It's an excellent source, of course, for locating someone. And it will provide you in-depth information that is often listed on death certificates. You can see the example here of a young man uh, named Clayton Monroe Lime, who was 34 years of age, certainly should have not have died from any other condition because of his age. He was a healthy person, a healthy male, a uh, middle-aged male. And on his death certificate, the cause of death is clearly stated as that of influenza. When someone dies from an unknown cause or where the person dies without a physician, a physician in attendance at the time of death, usually this means that a coroner is going to be summoned and then a medical examiner file is usually opened. What you want to do to look at coroner records, besides the obvious first place I would check would be to look to see what exists on family search. That would be the first place I would look by plugging in the keyword coroner under a keyword search and then a location. But if nothing exists in family search, certainly consult your local jurisdiction, determine the statutes that relate. Statutes is another word for the law relating to these case files <clears throat> and determine whether one they're available and if you find that they are available who has custody of those records an often overlooked resource i think that can offer genealogical details during this period that could be very helpful that might help you know if someone died or a family that might have been affected is an overlooked source as far as city directories are concerned I have an example. This is a 1918 city directory from the city of Rochester, New York, in Monroe County, upstate New York, along the I-90 corridor between Syracuse and Buffalo, about halfway. You can see the name I've highlighted there, Walter Knight and his wife, Marcella. He's a plumber. They reside at 1458 Main Street East in Rochester. That's the 1918 directory. The following year, Walter G. Knight is listed in the same city directory in 1919. Only this time it lists his death date. City directories, not all, but quite a number of them, recorded death dates in the directories, just as you see published here in printed form. Because the date is October of 1918, we know historically that this was the period of time of the third and final strain, the worst 
strain in which more deaths occurred than the previous two. The likelihood of Walter Knight dying from the pandemic is very high, especially knowing that he was not old. This man was a young man. He was a, he was a had a young bride. As it turned out, both he and his wife died from the pandemic. They lived in a double home with other relatives, and they also succumbed to the same disease. The obituary carried in the Rochester newspaper, you can see on the right, tells us everything that we need to know about what happened to this family during the pandemic. Mr. Knight died first. Four days later, his wife died. And it also provided her maiden name. I think one of the best sources for locating information about families that were connected to the pandemic can be found in court records. If someone in your family died, there would likely be copies of probate or an estate filing. Property could have changed hands. Houses could have been sold or foreclosed on. Hence, you would have a deed or a sheriff's deed record. Because they were taxpayers, they would drop off the tax list. Or even those in extreme cases may have lost everything financially and had filed bankruptcy. This is before the Chandler Act of 1938. We were under the umbrella of the 1898 Last and Final Bankruptcy Act, National Act. All of these records could have impacted your families that were killed and died as a result of the flu. On the other side of the coin, you have military records. As I had indicated, there are lots of military records that relate to those who suffered. Well, the first set of military records you always go to, the go-to first place is always the official military personnel files. They're called OMPFs. That is the abbreviation. If someone died while in service, they created a separate file, separate from the OMPF. These were mortuary or casualty files. Later during World War II, they became known as IDPFs, individual deceased personnel files. Other places to consider are morning reports, troop transport lists, headstone applications, the Gold Star Mother pilgrimage, hospital records that related directly to military personnel. All of these are places to find information about those who died or those who survived. Let's just take them individually. I'll kind of run through them quickly. The first place, again, as I had mentioned, is the OMPF file. These are housed at the National Personnel Record Center in St. Louis. This is the image of the exterior of the building. Now, as a patron, you can access these records three ways. You visit there in person. They are open now, limited open, but you need an appointment. They need to know you're coming. And it would be wise to request the records prior to your arrival. So one, the records are available, you'll know they're available and they've located them because there is a problem with these records, which I will get into. The second way is to employ an independent researcher. They'll provide you a list. You work out the arrangements with the researcher. And the third and final way, which is the longest uh, way is to submit a written request for the records the archives does have on their website a PDF form that you fill out and mail in. No money needs to be sent until they've located the file. What you need to know are what records were affected. There was a fire in 1973. And you need to know, secondly, what records can you access? What records are freely accessible to you? Public records, not restricted. Well, first off, records become archival at that facility, 62 years after the service member is separated from the military. So anyone, any soldier, 
sailor, Marine, anyone, male or female that was in the service, no matter what the branch, so every branch of service who was discharged before 1960 is considered archival. You do not have to have any proof of relationship that is not subject to access restrictions. It's a rolling date. That date moves forward one calendar day every single day. Today, it is December 15th, 1960. Anything before that is public record. Tomorrow, it is December 16th, 1960. Every day before that is public record. So getting the records is not going to be a problem as far as access is concerned. Your bigger problem that you'll have to wrestle with is the whether or not the file exists. On July 12th, 1973, a disastrous fire ravaged the building where it was located on Page Boulevard in downtown St. Louis. The original building, that's it photographed here on this slide for you. It affected records of the Army and the Air Force. The Air Force was post-World War II era, which doesn't cover our period of time, but you should know about it. Uh, the reason the date of 1947, very simple. The Air Force is a separate military branch in 1947. Prior to that, they're part of the Army. But Army personnel discharged between November 1st, 1912 and January 1st, 1960. 80% of those records were lost or destroyed due to the fire. This image does not do the fire justice. You're only seeing the exterior of the building. What about the interior? What did it look like after the fire was brought under control? This was what the staff had to walk into once given the okay to go back in. It was a major disaster. Records exist, but were they able to save them? There are reconstructed files that were veterans were asked to resubmit copies of documents. There were burnt files, files that clearly survived, but have burn marks or water damage. And if none of those exist, you won't walk out empty-handed. You'll at least get what's called an auxiliary file. That is the final payroll of your soldier family member. <clears throat> but if they died while in service from any situation, whether as a POW, died of combat, died of disease, these, again, during World War II were called IDPFs, Individual Deceased Personnel Files. But during World War I, they had another name for them. They called them mortuary files. Sometimes you'll see them listed as casualty files. You might even see them as burial case files. Do not confuse these with OMPFs. They are not the same record. These survived. No fire damage. Nothing was damaged in these files because these files were not ever in St. Louis originally. They were held in the custody of the Army in Fort Knox. And then slowly over the years, they were accessioned and sent to St. Louis after the fire. The name of the veteran, their unit, their organization, their rank, the date and cause of death, the location, their location of temporary burial, if, if it was applicable, information on their permanent burial, medical records, a topographical map where the veteran was buried in some cases, like if it was in a war zone, for an example. Not really something you would see with the pandemic, but still, all of this is included in these files. Once you've exhausted the OMPFs, and if applicable to your situation, the IDPFs, you have a couple other places you can still search to look for information about someone who suffered from the pandemic. There might be something that is contained on muster rolls or on morning reports. These were not affected by the fire. These reports allowed for men to be registered on their regimental and company level and battalion level roles of mustering. 
And to go along with that, the army also recorded morning reports. And as the name implies, these were recorded every morning. These are exception based reports, meaning that to appear in the morning report, the soldier's status had to have changed in some way. Something must have happened outside of the routine. The soldier was killed. The soldier was wounded. The soldier was hospitalized. The soldier was captured. Something happened to the soldier outside of the routine. Unfortunately, with both the muster rolls and the morning reports, there's no mail service. Your only option is to visit in person or hire a researcher. But you must know the military unit. The only loss that was suffered from the fire was slight for the morning reports, but the muster rolls were completely intact. Here's an example of a morning report. You can see here the morning report dated January of 1919. These are all the events in Company K of the 53rd Pioneer Infantry. It breaks it down by company. Each and every company has their own morning report. All the events for that month and year. You can see at the very top, on January 1st, 1919, Private Lewis Chapman, L is for Lewis, Company K of the 53rd Pioneer Infantry, followed by a series of numbers, 209-4802. That is his military service number. Unique to him. Just think of it as your social security number. He was transferred to the hospital. And it was per general order number 111 of the American Expeditionary Force. It doesn't state here the reason why, but in other records, it tells me why. Because Private Lewis Chapman got sick with the flu and was transferred to hospital to be treated. If your soldier died while over in Europe, and died from the pandemic or any other cause of death. We know that their names were placed on troop ship manifests listed as passengers when they went to Europe and when they came back. I don't think very few people are aware that even those who are dead are also recorded by name on these manifests. So if they were repatriated back to the United States, their names would be listed on the troop ship manifest. The name of the soldier, their rank, their service number, their company or regiment, their emergency next of kin are usually listed. That's on a normal manifest. But if they were repatriated, it didn't include as much. It wasn't as full a contingent of information. Here's an example of a group of individuals, all who arrived on the United States Army transport ship, the Wheaton, USAT, United States Army transport, bound for Hoboken from Brest, France. You can see here the arrow points to Private Walter H. Smith, service number 296-0350. He served in Battery A of the 310th Field Artillery. Private Smith was died in Europe, and his body was, uh, he was buried, of course, and then he was removed for burial and repatriated back to the United States. Now, looking at this list alone, you would not know his cause of death. How are we to know that Private Smith whether he died in combat or from any other cause. If we didn't have copies of his service file, the OMPF, we have another source to look at at the state level. I knew this man was from New Jersey. Every state recorded what were called statement of service cards. Unfortunately, they're not available for every state. Some states threw them out. That was real bright. 
Illinois being one of them. Others are just not complete. The ones for New Jersey have never been digitized. I apologize for the quality of this image. It's the best I could get. These are held in the custody of the New Jersey State Archives in Trenton. And as you can see here, about three quarters of the way down through this card index, this statement of service record for Private Smith, it says here that he died of influenza and bronchial pneumonia on the 19th of October, 1918. Everything else on the record was pretty much provided on the ship's list. His military unit, his service number, his name, all of that was provided. The additional information here are his parents or his family contact information, his mother's name and address, and of course, his age and when and where he was inducted into the military. Now, his mother, Mrs. Lillian Moore, would have been eligible in the conditions and terms of the Gold Star mothers who had lost either a son or, and it was later extended to include widows. These women all received a Gold Star medal of their fallen hero, and they were encouraged to display them in their homes, like on mantles, places where any visitors could see them. The Gold Star Mothers organization did not come into existence until the late 1920s. President Calvin Coolidge passed a bill into law that year, and it authorized all those who died from April 5th, 1917, the day before we entered the war, through July 1st, 1921. So three years after the end of the war. Anyone who died in that frame of time that was in the military from any cause of death. In October of 1933, when the program officially ended, there were 17,389 women who were eligible to travel to Europe to visit the graves of those who had not been repatriated. Barely a third of them made that pilgrimage. 6,693. That was all that made it. I don't suspect to have the answer why so few a number as far as percentage is concerned. They're, this was a personal thing. I mean, maybe some of these mothers and widows couldn't bring themselves to go for various reasons. We don't know their situations. But what we do know is the numbers that went. On Ancestry, they have a published list of these mothers and widows of soldiers, sailors, Marines, all entitled to make the pilgrimage, that larger number. And it's listed by state alphabetically and broken down by county alphabetically. This is the page for the part of the state of Virginia. James City County is listed at the top. That's Williamsburg, Virginia, near the historic triangle. Williamsburg, Yorktown. Um, I, for, uh, I forget the third one. Williamsburg and Yorktown are the two of the three triangles, uh, older cities. Williamsburg, that's the third triangle. <laughs> Forgot sometimes. Anyway, you've got the names uh, and addresses of either the mother or the widow, the relationship. So three of these women are mothers. One is a widow. The name of the deceased soldier, their rank, their military unit, the cemetery in Europe where they're buried, again, not patri repatriated, and whether or not they desired to make the pilgrimage. In the case of all four of these women from that county in Virginia, all four chose not to go. For those who said yes and did go, you'll want to go to Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland and contact the Veterans Grave Services records in Record Group 92, which is the Quartermaster General, and they have the original files of all those women, mothers and widows, 
who made those trips and a record of their experiences. Our last couple of things that we'll just end out on, we've got a couple more slides and then we're done. You may also want to consider looking in depth at medical records. The military did a fantastic job of maintaining a record of those who were sick in hospitals, patients in hospitals, some of which, of course, you know, died as a result of the pandemic. This is the United States Army base at South Beach Hospital in Lincoln, Oregon. On the bottom right is the same area of the hospital, only it's a photograph of the military personnel that were stationed there, along with their camp dog, which I think is really cute. And you see the cover of the book there, 1918 to 1919, Patients in the South Beach Military Hospital. Once you open up the book, it's page after page after page of those patients that were admitted to that hospital for whatever cause. Take, for an example, Ernest Fuel. Private Fuel, his service number is listed there, 878059. His military unit, ADSP, which is the 80th Spruce Squadron. A Spruce Squadron was a special military unit, like the Pioneer Division of World War I. These were men who felled trees. They worked on roads. They corduroyed roads, that sort of work. Most of it was domestic, however. He was admitted into the hospital on December 27th, 1918. His cause of death was listed as that of being a rash. And another record noted that it was also influenza that was attributing to his death when he died four days later at 6.20 a.m. in the morning. You'll note this hospital record took, uh, took great care in recording the fact that everyone who died is listed in red, bold, ink, and the time of death, a.m. or p.m. But not everyone on this list here died. You have others who suffered from influenza but survived, who were in the same outfit as Ernest Fuel. One of those was this man, Elgin Bartlett. He was on another page. You can see 84th Spruce Squadron. You can see his rank. And what he did was he survived the pandemic. He was admitted into the hospital on December 25th of 1918. What a, what a Christmas present that is. And was discharged on January 2nd, 1919, the day after Fuel died at 4.30 in the afternoon. But yet you can see he survived his experience, was discharged from the Army, and died 20 years later in 1937. Now, he wasn't that old when he died. He was in his late 40s, still quite young, I think, to die. Could his cause of death had something to do with the illness that he had 20 years earlier? These are, again, the unknowns. We don't know how COVID has affected our long-term life expectancy, our mortality rate. We just don't know this information, just like we don't know exactly what happened 100 years ago. But because he was in the Army and he chose his family chose to bury him in a military cemetery, they applied for a government headstone. And this was a government headstone record, which I've given you in your handout. You have a four-page handout, which the, uh, the host has uh, put up a link for you. Please use the handout. It has links in there to records that I've talked about during this entire presentation. Uh, and you can go directly to those records and do your own research. I'd like to end with another image. I think that's another really sobering image. And just to tell you that this flu did not discriminate whatsoever. This flu hit rural and urban areas worldwide 
with equal fury. The healthy adults were the hardest hit group of individuals that died as a result of the pandemic. 25% of the United States population was attacked. And in turn, our national, and this is recorded, our national life expectancy in the United States dropped 12 full years. This number would not recover for more than a decade. This image from the Library of Congress shows you a, a, a truck carrying caskets uh, as, as safely, I guess, as they could, could transport them. That was one thing that was a problem during the pandemic, at the height of the pandemic, the availability of caskets in places to bury those that had died. And, and those who would come in contact with the dead after the time of death, because presumably, you know, they were still contagious and the mortuary people could also get sick or, or pass the disease on to other living relatives. This is something that uh, it's hard to talk about, I think, in a lecture. I hope I've, uh, I hope I've been able to do this topic justice. I hope that you enjoyed listening to the, the our topic tonight and hope that you were able to glean something useful from it as far as information and answers to questions about your own family. And with that said, I want to again thank BYU for the the uh, the chance to come and talk with uh, talk at, uh, for the family history center there at the university. It's a it's a great opportunity to share to share my knowledge. And with that, I want to turn the time back over to the host. And I'll leave the screenshot on this last screen. And I'm certainly willing to entertain uh, any number of questions. Go ahead, and Olivia. All right, perfect. We'll just wait a couple minutes if anyone has any questions that they'd like to type in the chat. Looks like we have a comment from Desiree Williams who says, thank you for making the correlation between the 1918 pandemic and the COVID pandemic along with the long-term effects. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mentioned that specifically for that reason. All right, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Just some other comments. Yeah, I'm um, reading. I'm reading them as well. Awesome. Yeah, we'll go ahead and close. No, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on January 12th with James Tanner. He will be giving a presentation entitled "How to Research Your Genealogy in Archives and Libraries." A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.